And guys, let's start off with the one question with the success you guys have seen from the corporate part of the world, the connection with the youth, uh, especially with NBA Cares, Commissioner. How do you connect to today's youth, considering, you know, some, some of these kids growing up, the attitudes, uh, you know, of, hey, it's bleak. I'm not sure what's going to happen next. How do you connect from the corporate part to well, the youth? In a funny way, I don't even call it corporate. I mean, I just got back April from Mumbai, where we worked with Magic Box, a great NGO. Uh, and we're initiating a program where we expect to reach a million and a half Indian kids over the next three years to deal with the values of sport. And by the values, what we really mean is a sense of a teaching vehicle, a sense of accomplishment, learning something new, and hopefully a sense for support from the government of something that involves exercise, fitness, good health, and lower health care costs. And the kids eat it up. The place we went in Mumbai, uh, we had a neatly organized, uh, wonderfully clad group of kids with their white NBA Magic Box shirts and sitting up watching us were the true owners of the Y that we were at. And these kids had every counterfeit NBA jersey you could possibly imagine. <laughs> and, and we actually had a second session for them. They mobbed us uh, because they want someone to care a little bit about them. And I think we have an enormous opportunity of caring in sports that is going to influence kids to make better choices, to feel better about themselves, and to find, in some case, a, a pathway that makes their life a bit better. And to follow up, I still have family in Mumbai, and one of my cousins, he obviously is fully aware of what I do. Have you interviewed Tracy McGrady? How about Kobe Bryant? They're fully aware of the connection the NBA has globally. Well, you know, the, the Indian uh, Premier League of cricket, and I went to a cricket match, uh, they get 10 million subscriber, uh, viewers. You know, we get like 80,000. <laughs> but, but there is a, an awareness. Yes. Uh, broadband is coming. Uh, and we've had probably a dozen players visit India, and they've always mobbed, and it's, it's going to be spe spectacular. Chris, Chris Bosch was there this past summer, right? Correct. In connection with the NBA. Correct. Uh, Governor Rendell, how, how do you think the role of government should play when you're connecting to the youth through sport? Well, some of the things that David talked about, some of the aims that the professional sports have uh, are consistent and concurrent with the aims of government. Uh, for example, better health for kids, exercise, fitness. Uh, that's been, a, as we all know, a, a priority for Mrs. Obama, and she's done a great job. It's been a priority for us in Harrisburg. We passed a, a law that gave incentive dollars to supermarkets who would locate in uh, uh, what we called the deserts, food deserts, where there was no access to real produce and vegetables, and the only thing kids could get is fast food. So sometimes the programs work concurrently. Uh, the Philadelphia Eagles, who I know Beyond Sports honored a few years ago, have a great program, the Eagles Care, and it's devoted towards children and learning and, and so many things. Uh, uh, and those are goals of the government as well. So sometimes we work together uh, in a formal, formalized fashion. And sometimes it's just uh, together in a sense of creating, you know, this old debate about players as role models. The players don't have to be role models, but if they're willing to, it's a great help. Someone who really had a reputation for being a sort of a, a bad guy, Alan Iverson. When I was mayor, Alan Iverson showed up at tons of things that I did as mayor in the neighborhoods talking to kids. And when he talked to kids, they listened because it was Alan Iverson. I mean, first they heard the mayor and everybody's attention was wandering. And then Alan, and Alan gets up and the kids were riveted. And, and isn't that true about well, Alan? It's always, it's true about it's even true about the Kemi Mutombo. <laughs> <laughs> Except no one can understand him. Very right? subtle entrance here. All seven foot two of him comes wandering in and, and blocks out the sun, and here we have to come in after him. Somebody said about the Kembe that, that he speaks seven languages and you can't understand him in <laughs> any one. Yeah, 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 that was me. That was me. Okay. No, but you know, I, I think to the to really there is a 
uh, an emerging partnership. I think that, and it's really multifaceted. Our teams in all sports, our leagues, our governments, our players, and m maybe most importantly, the NGOs that form a part of the ecosystem are really coming together on a global basis. That's why I think uh, Beyond Sport is so important, and that's why you know, we, we, we support it the way we do, because the NGOs are finally you know, getting the recognition for providing the continuing and ongoing expertise, regardless of what government happens to be in power or in office, sure. or even what the philosophy is of any particular league or team. And, and Kevin, uh, I know a lot of people saw the movie Invictus, which was a great movie about Nelson Mandela and, and the choices he made that were so important to bring a country together. He used sports to do something that no one thought possible, to bring the Afrikaners and the, the native uh, population together. Extraordinary. But the thing that I took away from Invictus is just remembering the joy of the kids as they saw the, the, the Springboks players, the joy of the kids. Sports can be so uplifting. It can be so hopeful. It's tough out there. It's tough in the United States of America in many places, the richest country in the world. It's really tough in other places of the world as well. And sports can lift like nothing else. See, I, 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 I hope we're equal to the task, okay? B B Kempi and I were in South Africa in 1993. It was a dangerous time. And soon to be President Mandela said, I'm glad you didn't bring books because our children can't read. But we will, but sports is important for safety purposes, for engagement, for giving them a sense of feeling better about themselves. Uh, it was really one of the most uh, amazing meetings that I ever had. And there was the Kemby and, and uh, the next year, Patrick and Alonzo together with Wes Unseld and Lenny Wilkins, I mean, this was 20 years ago, uh, but sports sort of stopped things uh, in their tracks, and the kids gathered around the Kemby and the other players in a way that was astounding. We went to, I think, three cities, Durban, uh, Johannesburg, uh, one other place, I can't remember where it was, and, and whenever the players appear, the world stops and the kids are wrapped and listen. How did that trip, especially meeting Nelson Mandela changed things for you and your perspective with the global impact of the league? I, I uh, it was, I'm, I, I'm a, a slow study, and so it's taken me 30 years to get to where I am, but, and uh, I firmly believe that sport has, you know, Nick says sport, I say sports, that's a trans-ocean kind of a thing, but I think that sports uh, has this enormous capacity through its values, through the attention that we get, through, the, uh, through our athletes, through all that we do, to really make an important contribution. And we should be severely criticized if we don't take advantage of it. And, and, and really, we shouldn't talk about it as an opportunity, we should talk about it as an obligation. And it, it gets renewed every day. You know, the first thing, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna behave myself for the record here, which is unlike me, but uh, you know, the first phone call to the new head of the Olympics is from President Putin, uh, and everyone wants to talk about the Russian law on uh, homosexuality, okay? I mean, think about the, op the opportunities that sports has to make a continuing statement, and the only thing that we're saying in that context is, shh, no one say anything because, uh, you know, this is, you know, the ghost of Avery Brundage is flying over the International Olympic Committee, in my view. How does a government handle something like that, Governor Rendell, when, when you're dealing with social economic issues and also sport, and you're carrying a certain type of leadership as well, in general? Well, probably the, where that uh, issue hits uh, the, the rubber hits the road most on an issue like that, Kevin, is on funding of sports stadiums. It's always controversial. Uh, it's always difficult. There are so many needs in most American cities, so many needs that are going unmet. 
even during the time that I was mayor, we got credit for an incredible municipal turnaround, but I knew that there were still incredible challenges that we didn't have the resources to fully meet. Uh, but at the same time, the question came up, are we going to have new stadiums? Um, and you have to keep in mind the importance of the stadiums economically and the impact of, of a downtown stadium, whether it's basketball or baseball or whatever, the economic impact is clearly discernible over the years. And if government invests X amount of dollars, it will get those dollars back over the course of time. Now, that's a tough argument to make to a citizenry. Um, but the second thing about uh, uh, those decisions are sports has a unifying effect that nothing else in society has. And I think if you're in government, you understand that. Because a good mayor, a good governor, we're in the streets all the time. We're talking to people all the time. And the mood in Philadelphia since Monday night. Completely different. Completely different. People have forgotten about the the day-to-day -day problems. People are uplifted a little bit. And the great thing about sports is it's an incredible leveler. The shoeshine guy and the president of the bank can talk about whether we ran Shady McCoy too many times on Monday night yeah. and whether they're going to make, and the shoeshine guy may have a better insight than the, the president of the bank. And, and there's, you can't run a city or a state or, for that matter, a country just on bottom line. There's something tangible. There's something you, you, the intangible. You can't put your hand on it. You can't see it in an audit. But it's something about spirit and, and life. And we feel it more in Philadelphia. I think David will probably posit that Philadelphians are a little bit more sports mad than the average city. Yeah. We feel it. When Smarty Jones was making his incredible run to the Triple Crown, he, Smarty trained at Philadelphia Park uh, uh, right across the city limits, people were crazed. People would come up to me the, the week before the Belmont and said, when he wins the Triple Crown, are we going to have a parade down Broad Street? This is for a horse. For Smarty a horse. Jones, a horse. Smarty Jones. I said, we're going to put Smarty Jones, I mean, I think I've done a decent job repairing our streets, but we're going to put a $10 million horse marching down Broad Street, or we're going to put him on a flatbed truck. People said, why not? <laughs> They're that desperate for a parade. Absolutely. Yeah. But we, uh, you know we are. Exactly. And, and during Governor uh, Rendell's time as mayor here, too, we've seen the city build two stadiums. Uh, actually, three, if you right. include the Wachovia Center as well. Right. Um, so, Commissioner Stern, you've seen the NBA expand uh, during your time, too, and you've dealt with building stadiums. Yeah. You've dealt with the dynamic of, hey, sport impacting a government. How do you handle billionaire owners with the concept of building something and expanding a league, and also the governments, the well, city politicians, and handling the money that goes uh, into it? Our most recent endeavor has been in Sacramento where Mayor Kevin Johnson has been terrific. He is using uh, the, uh, a, a government-private partnership to change the makeup of downtown Sacramento. It starts out with jobs, uh, union jobs, Governor. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, and, it, and, it, and it, it also deals with, with businesses starting up again and really taking uh, a, a neighborhood that's down on itself and also playing on what I would say the cultural institution that sports represents. Absolutely. You know, you, you want to bring people to your community. It's great to have good schools, the Philharmonic, great libraries, and it doesn't hurt to have the unifying force of a sports team or teams in the case of Philadelphia that does bring people together. It's, I call it egal the most egalitarian. If you, it doesn't matter whether you sit in the nosebleed or at courtside, your opinion is as good as anybody else. And if you want to watch, you know, the question is, do you have games? So whether it's Bill Bradley from Princeton or Willis Reed from Grambling, the question is, can you contribute here? And that's a very important lesson out there that we, we love to talk about and continue. And just quickly, Kevin, one point that David made, neighborhood development, a sports stadium can sp can spawn incredible neighborhood development. And if you don't believe me, go to Washington, D.C. And they deliberately, Mayor Thompson placed that stadium, not Mayor Thompson, Mayor Williams, placed that stadium in a rundown area of Washington, D.C. And that area is changing 
each year that the Nationals play. There's housing, there are stores, there are all sorts of retail now, there are small businesses that are locating there. It's amazing how it has uh, uh, motivated uh, incredible development in an area of Washington that had pretty much been written off. Abe, Abe Poland, the owner of the Washington Wizards, was determined to use his ownership to turn around an entire neighborhood in downtown Washington. Uh, I, and he did it with his own money. I said, Abe, at least buy some land. <laughs> Absolutely not. We're going to make this stadium work. We're going to change Washington for the better. And indeed, they did. And they and built a Verizon Center. They built a Verizon Center. And the Center. interesting thing is, you know, government turns with good leaders. Same thing with sports. You get an owner like Abe Poland, who was a great man, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you some owners that don't make a huge difference. Well, they're not in the NBA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there could be one in South Florida yeah. in baseball. Yeah. What's missing right now, Governor, in today's world when it comes to leadership of young people, that next generation in your mind? Well, two things. Um, a, a lot of leaders in, in our business politics don't talk to young people. They're, they don't have a vision. They don't think about what do I want Pennsylvania to be like 25 years down the road. It's what do I want Pennsylvania to be like up to my next re-election. Right. A and so there's vision lacking, and, and as a result, you lose a lot of young people. But secondly, young people ha have a great sense of knowing who's real and who's not. Just a great innate sense. And this goes, and I'm sure David would agree with me, this goes down to kids seven and eight and nine. And they look at politicians who are scared, who are afraid to act, uh, and juxtapose them to politicians who say, this is what we're going to do, and here's why, and let's go. And so that's the sense of, of leadership, I think, that connects with young people. You don't have to know the lingo. One thing you shouldn't be is a phony. Yeah. You shouldn't be a phony. You shouldn't try to have your the young guys and your staff teach you some buzzwords yeah. when you're going to talk to a bunch they'll of kids. They'll sniff you out. Oh, they'll sniff you out in two seconds. You're not on Instagram? No, I'm not on Instagram. <laughs> Are you on Instagram? <laughs> Tumblr? No, I'm not on <laughs> Wait, I gotta Pinterest. show you, David, I gotta show you something. Twitter, Facebook? Oh, you it's still a flip, a flip phone. phone. How about that? Uh, oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> I would, if I wanted the computer, I'd bring out my iPhone, but actually I carry it only with my Blackberry. Oh. So I, so I went, and they took away my flip phone forcibly at the office because they, they couldn't serve well, it. contracts, of course. No, but it's, I, I just want to endorse, they're stepping over into the political realm, I guess. The kids know. It isn't about the pals that just that tweet to them or, right. or are doing their lingo. They, they, they watch, they listen, they understand the sense of purpose and leadership and, and what's important. And, and what really, what we're hungering for is somebody who recognizes the risk of a particular course of action, but decides that that's where he or she wants to be and that's the right thing to do and they're gonna do it. And it's hard to And, that, and that's true. And that that's true in your business too. I mean, I was talking to David uh, backstage, and I'm especially nice to him because he has always contributed to my campaigns. But oh, you're winning my uh, reputation. <laughs> I talked about what a tough step it was, but how well it's worked out for not only the NBA but for that city to put a major sports franchise in a city the size of Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. People thought th that was crazy, and I'm sure you got a lot of grief from a lot of your owners. But it's been remarkable for the NBA and remarkable for all of Oklahoma. Yeah. As we've gone sort of fishing for where the fishes are, uh, you know, one of the niches we've carved out, I think, is a determination that certainly in the smaller markets, if there's a, a single team or one or two teams, this is a place that we can succeed. So it started, I was reminded recently on the anniversary of the Hornets being in Charlotte, but, but I guess it's 25 years. Uh, you know, Charlotte, I didn't even know where Charlotte was. Now it has, because as an NFL team, they came right in after us, but it was a great success and I never felt so proud as reading an insert in the New York Times, come to Charlotte, the symphony, to this, to that, the Hornets. It's a good yeah, place to course. locate. And, and now with Oklahoma City, uh, San Antonio, Portland. Utah, Portland, uh, 
or even Orlando, uh, Orlando, you know, Sacramento, uh, fans are very appreciative of the ability to gather around their team. And the fewer teams there are, the less competition there is for so many eyeballs, corporate dollars, fan support. And it's a, it, it works. It really does work. And it really helps to have an athlete like Kevin Durant who wants to stay, uh, uh, who embraces the city there. And he's yes. not looking at New York yes. or L.A. or Chicago. He embraces where his uh, environment is. And now, Governor Rendell, help me understand this one thing. And, and I'm not asking you to speak for everybody here. But one thing that I always find that's missing in the last 20 years with all the budget cuts in the school system, how much are kids being affected when they lose gym class and they can't have that connection when they go to school? As we hear stories about people connecting through sport. Well, very much so. I mean, one, just purely substantively, they lose out because they're less fit. And when you're less fit, you don't concentrate as well. There are a whole lot of things that happen just from losing the physical activity. But more than that, sports, and I never played anything beyond high school, but the lessons I learned in high school playing sports were infinitely more valuable to me in later life than the lessons I learned in the classroom, you know, even though I learned some good lessons there. Kids learn to cooperate with each other, to play together. They learn teamwork. Teamwork, of course. Leadership. It's hard to learn teamwork in a social studies class. No, no, it's true. But it's pretty easy to learn teamwork at playing soccer or playing basketball. And, and, and that's the, the important part of it. And it's important how the school does sports. It's interesting, I was listening to, gosh, I don't know if any of you are going to remember this, but Janice Ian had a song called 17, mm -hmm. and it was about growing up as an ugly duckling girl, but there was a line in there, the kids whose names are never called when choosing sides for basketball. And almost every kid, who, except for Dikembe, <laughs> has experienced that <laughs> in some way, shape, or form. But yet, it depends how it's done, and, and, and sports can be such a, a motivator for kids to do the right thing, to cooperate, to like each other, to take care of each other, no bullying. And if we take that out of school, we are losing so much more than, 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 than just the money we're saving. We, we have taken it out of school. I think when the UK decided that it was really important to have so many hours of physical activity a week, they then looked and saw, oh my gosh, we sold off the fields, we shut down the gyms, right. we have a problem on our hands. And, and really, what happens in the time of budget cuts? They take away music, mm -hmm. Art. sports, things that allow kids their certain ability to express themselves and, and learn about playing as part of the band or the team or, do, or, or developing a sense of confidence or competence. And it's a, it's a very, very serious governmental uh, malfunction in my view. We have uh, just a couple minutes, and I've been saving this question for last, okay? Would you have been a better commissioner or politician? <laughs> You're, you can't be a commissioner without being a politician. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay? And, and, and maybe uh, not necessarily a gentle and conforming politician, but a politician nevertheless with a particular point of view of wanting to get done, and especially in terms of leading rather than following from behind. I mean, we've had the opportunity in a number of ways, starting with Magic Johnson announcing that he was HIV positive. I had an owner suggest that we should do some polling. We might have been out a little bit ahead of ourselves on that, and the answer was, you know, what's the use of that? We have an opportunity to lead. Not what's the use of it, but why would we do that? We have an opportunity to lead here and change the debate on AIDS, which we did, HIV and AIDS. Uh, so I think there are, it, it, we're in the same business on an ongoing basis, uh, politicians and commissioners. Governor Rendell, or should I call you Commissioner Rendell? Do you he could do have it. the option? He could do it. Well, every good politician is a commissioner in yes, the sir. sense that David's got his constituents, uh, the owners. Uh, I had my constituents, the legislature. And you treat the legislature well and don't always do what they want, but explain to them, be transparent. You'll get things done, just like David has done. I mean, again, not to just blow smoke at David, but no commissioner has advanced his league more. And he's done it by 
spending time with the owners. There's no question by, by bringing them along. You know, President Obama, a person who I admire extraordinarily uh, for, for his intelligence and his value system and, and for his ability to raise people up, but he, he just doesn't spend enough time. It's time consuming being a good leader. You, you, you've got to spend time and you've got to, uh, there's a line in Buzz Bissinger's book that uh, he did about my first term as mayor, Prayer for the City. Um, he did something besides LeBron? <laughs> he did, he oh, did, okay. oh yeah. Um, I'm sitting at my desk, this is a sports story, and I get a call from a state senator Thursday morning of the Duke-Kentucky game, the most famous college basketball game maybe ever, it was in Philadelphia at the then Spectrum, mm -hmm. and it was a hugely hot ticket, and I had bought through my political action committee 40 tickets because I knew that people would be asking me for them, but I had given them all away. And this state senator calls and demands two tickets to the game. And I could have told him, what are you calling me four hours before the game? There are no tickets, get lost. But he was head of a committee that was very important to the things that we wanted to get done as in the city. So I said, I'll, I'll find you two tickets. And I think I took two tickets away from a, a staff member to do it. But I slammed down the phone and I said something which Buzz put in verbatim in the book, which I can't tell you here. <laughs> but, it had, but it had to do with politicians being, if people have no idea about politicians, how much time we spend on our knees. <laughs> yeah. okay. I'm. I'm much better than the mayor. I, 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 I would rather give them my tickets. When they're, especially if they're sponsors who are paying us seven figures a year. I, it's not that big a game. Who cares? It's only the, the, it's only the Lakers in New York for their one time a year. Go, enjoy. Why weren't you at the game last night, David? Well, it was kind of. I watched it on TV. Uh, uh, you know. One final request. I hope the Sixers get the number one pick in the 2014 draft. That is so uh, small. Okay? Uh, I, I, I hope they have a great year and they're not eligible for the draft. Okay, that's the yes. difference. Commissioner Stern, Governor Rendell. Thank you, man. A lot of fun. A lot of fun.